If the Bible's got you tied in knots, if you're burdened with religious thoughts, come grab a drink and join the choir. It's Heretic Happy Hour. Hallelujah, glory, glory be. Thank you and welcome to the Heretic Happy Hour podcast, brothers and sisters. I am one of your three co-hosts of the Heretic Happy Hour podcast. My name is Keith Giles. I am the author of several books, the most recent being Jesus Undefeated, Condemning the False Doctrine of Eternal Torment. Hallelujah. And I am joined by my joined by my two co-hosts, Matt and Jamal. Hey guys, introduce yourselves. Say hi. Hi, friends. Hi, friends. My name is Jamal Javanji. It is a pleasure to be back on the Heretic Happy Hour podcast with you guys. Um, super excited about this series, the meta. Mm-hmm. Oh, wait, that's I'm stealing thunder here. Or did we? Well, no, no you go for it. Uh, Just go for it. Tell them. Tell them what it well, is. Well, I'm super excited about the metaphysical series that we're starting. Yes, 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 yes. Because, because uh, meta means beyond mm. and physical means obviously physical. So we're going to go beyond like, does life go beyond the physical, which I believe it does. So we're going to get into a lot of cool stuff. So I'm also the author of living for a living, um, which came out uh, April of last year. And it's also available in an audio audio formats at audible.com. So make sure you check that out. And that's me. And uh, I am Matt. I got the goddamn flu right now, so I could use some uh, some supernatural metaphysical healing right now. <laughs> and I wish, I wish, wa- glory, yeah, uh, God damn it, Keith, your <laughs> your uh, intro was you had too much energy for me today, man. I'm telling you what. <laughs> and um, uh, Matt, yeah, Matt, before, Matt. yeah, yeah, what's I, up, I, my man? I, well, I I know you're not feeling well, but let's just say, okay, I'm not a doctor, but let's say if I was, you only play one on TV. Well, that's right. But and if I was a if I was a doctor that was interested in holistic health, I might suggest to you that uh, you consume some uh, some good superfood. Do you know anything about that? I do know something about that. Well, I don't know if our sponsor Wild Foods has what I've been taking. I've been taking elderberry because that's supposed to help, and I think it has been helping. But I'm not I'm not sure. But and I can't say this helps with the flu. But when you don't have the flu, they got wild cocotropic superfood cocoa drink mix, and it helps with your focus. And they got these mushrooms in there that they're a perfect addition to your morning coffee or your butter coffee, uh, what are they, with the bulletproof coffee if you're doing that. If you haven't used it, you are missing out. Mm. And, but I mean, you know, I, it can help me a little bit right now, but I just got to say like... I don't think they advertise it for the flu, but on a normal day, get on that shit. It is wildfoods.co. You get to use the happy hour one, two code for 12% off. So please go try that. It is super helpful. It does help you focus, um, gets the fog out. And uh, yeah, on any normal, on any normal day, it is going to make your morning that much Mm. better. Awesome. Good stuff. Super cool. Yeah. Super cool. And if I think um, if, if they use the the code happy hour 12, is that right? They get 12% oh, yeah. off. All That's day. Right. All day, yep. every day. On your, when you check out everything you, everything you order, our listeners, if they use that promo code, you're going to get 12% off your whole order. Well, I think, can I just say this about uh, wild foods and, and just the fact that first of all, I'm, I'm excited that we get to partner with a company like that. But I just think it's timely as well, because there's a lot of fear uh, spreading across the the globe about the, and understandably so, about the um, the coronavirus. You know, actually, actually it's affected, really affected. Oh, what's that? Uh, no, I never heard of that. What's that? Well, you might be one of the few people say, in the that world. A thing? <laughs> it's, a, it's a thing that stock market has <laughs> plummeted several thousand points because of the fears of the no thing spreading. Way. And it's, ser- I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a strong flu, but I was listening to a doctor. Actually, uh, there was a news organization that was talking about this and they asked this doctor and he goes, can we just put it in perspective? And then he kind of put it in perspective. He said, it is, yeah, it's a serious flu. He said, but the best thing I can tell people to, he said, what can people do to be prepared for this? He said, the best thing I can tell people to do is stock up, like pay attention to your immune system, stock up on things that, you know, help like vitamin. And he talked about vitamin A, like prevents, like protects your cell walls from, from, I mean, almost like prevent, you know, 
puts this uh, f- like force field around your cells from um, from viruses and bacteria to be able to penetrate them. So I thought that was a really interesting. Um, mm. Just thought that was really encouraging. And I just think like yeah, proactive health is so good, especially when there's you know flu yeah. seasons and things like that going around. Yeah. yeah, start off healthy, and then you're less likely to be you know like Matt here. You know, just totally blitzed by the flu. Well, no, I will say I've been taking elderberry, man, and and my symptoms have been not as bad as my daughter's. So mm-hmm. I think that helps. I think that's been shown. There's actually been studies about elderberry like lessening flu and cold symptoms. Yes. Yeah, for sure. You're right. Yes, you are. Yes, yeah. you are. Cool. Well, I, I wanted to also talk about this thing that, <clears throat> you know, I think sets us, uh, sets the Her- Heritage Happy Hour podcast um, above and beyond, you know, any other podcast. Um, and that's because we have our theme song, called, right? The theme song. Well, it, well I, I do like the theme song, but I, I wasn't referring to that. I was actually talking about no. the hotline. Um, uh, cause that is something no. that a lot of other podcasts don't have. We have a hotline. The purpose for that is because we like to engage our listeners, like to hear questions from them and, you know, and it really does help us to get, um, information feedback in from the hotline. So we're really thankful for that. We always get love to the hotline. Thank you. But we always, we always need more. So the the uh, the number to the hotline is 240-343-7379. So if you're listening to this, 240-343-7379, you can call it, leave a comment, encouragement. Uh, you can leave, you know, um, lots of different things. You can leave a tag. You can text. You you can, tag. Yeah, text. As a matter of fact, we have a text. Okay, here here's the text. Quote. Hi guys, this is Elena Brooks. I had a question. To preface, this is the season in which many people engage in Lent. It makes me think and question, can spiritual disciplines be helpful? But not primarily that. Truly, I am trying to know how to pursue what we call the Holy Spirit while knowing that I no longer put my trust in conventional church dogmas. I believe that I am known in the desire to show love, but so many quote unquote spiritual disciplines have been enshrouded in inadequacy, anxiety, and fear in the past. I don't know the best way to move forward to pursue love, joy, peace, etc. I would appreciate any thoughts or insights. Thank you, as always, for sharing them on this forum. Unquote. Hmm. What do you guys think? So the question is, are there any, can the spiritual disciplines be helpful, right? Yeah. So, <clears throat> well, I mean, I agree with, I agree with Elaine, by the way, Elena, love you so much. Uh, thank you for that comment, for that text. Um, well, I, I would agree that spiritual disciplines, or I, would, I guess I would say spiritual disciplines, I think really can be helpful, but I would agree with her comment that so often, and I think it's just the way people communicate the disciplines. I actually don't think the disciplines themselves are, are, um, are really focused themselves on fear and, and anxiety and, and inadequacy as she puts it. But I do, I do, I mean, I have experienced churches that have communicated the disciplines in that way and sort of that sort of worm theology perspective. But the way I first, um, I think if you read like Richard Foster's book, um, right, what is that book called? Spiritual Discipline? I think that's what it's called. Oh, maybe. The Disciplines or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, the way I understood it, it was more like, it's a way of looking at things that are practices that are in your life that are not healthy or that are kind of getting in the way of your hearing from God or connecting with God. And so the disciplines are really just ways of sort of eliminating those distractions so that you can sort of connect easier and hear better. Um, So that's why you would, for example, not eat food. You would fast because it kind of frees you up to kind of hear more clearly and, and, and recognize your connection with God. Or whatever, living living simply, for example, simplicity. Uh, you know, uh, that discipline is sort of like not being distracted by the things you own and materialism, and just focusing on just recognizing that you have the the essential things that you need and being grateful for those things. Um, and in, co- in other words, finding ways to incorporate um, into your spiritual practices. But again, that's the way I've always understood it. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm the only one. But I, I don't think I, I personally have never approach to spiritual disciplines from that sort of negative aspect. I've always approached it from the aspect of uh, eliminating things that kind of are already getting, getting in the way. Yeah. And I, I personally, I, I like the idea of something like Lent. Um, I don't always stick to it. I mean, I'd never stick to it myself necessarily, but I do things that are, are, are kind of Lenten in spirit. 
So it might not be during the season of Lent, but if I feel like, um, well, let's say I'm drinking too much and I'm like, oh, I'm going to eliminate alcohol for X amount of time. Just listening to my body, not necessarily based on the calendar or anything like that, just listening to my body and what brings more peace and what brings more um, wholeness and, and leaning into that. So, so she asks about l- learning to pursue what we call the Holy Spirit without inadequacy, anxiety, fear. I think just naturally the Holy Spirit is never going to bring those things. It's going to bring the opposite of those things. It's going to bring peace and love and joy and the fruit of the Spirit, right? So I think anytime we're pursuing the Holy Spirit, if someone tells you it's the Holy Spirit and it makes you anxious, it makes you full of fear, it gives you, you know, uh, all these feelings that, that we get. Um, when we have, Keith, what you'd call the worm um, theology, then that's yeah. not of the Spirit. It's what right. brings it's it's what brings joy and, and peace and love and, and mercy and kindness and all those things. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a gr- great text, a uh, great question. Um, in a nutshell, I don't like the word discipline, just personally. Like, I, I, it it, it kind of communicates a a have to kind of my oh, this is what I have to mm. do, you know. And I don't I don't like that. Yeah. Again, I, that may not be the case for everybody, but just as it is for me, so I don't like to use the word discipline. Um, I like, I do think that there's wisdom though in adopting practices. So practices that, and again, there are, they're rhythmic in nature. So it's not just like one time and you don't, you don't ever do it again. I mean, that isn't like, like brushing your teeth as a spiritual discipline. Like I, if you want to use that word, I actually think it is. I think everything's spiritual. First of all, I don't dis- distinguish between spiritual and non-spiritual. I think everything's spiritual because everything that exists comes from spirit even the physical mm-hmm. tangible universe. That's a whole other com- conversation. But so, so brushing your teeth is spiritual, but if you brush your teeth once every six months, it's not going to really benefit you very much, you know, but if you have a practice mm-hmm. where you brush your teeth, you know, you maybe even f- five, 10 minutes every, every day, twice a day, they might, that five, 10 minutes once every six months may not mean, but every day, a couple times a day, it's going to really benefit you. So I, I like the rhythmic nature of having a practice. So I would call them a practice as opposed to a discipline. Mm. So spiritual practices. Spiritual practices, yeah. yeah. And I think anything that will connect you back to self, um, and a lot of the spiritual quote unquote disciplines, you know, con- contemplation, you know, you, you know, uh, breathing, meditation, all these things, they really bring you back to self so that they quiet the mind in the sense that the, you, you tune out. You're not so focused on the, on the monkey mind, which is always busy. And you come back to breath and you start to get in touch with self that any discipline, any, and I use discipline in quotes, but any practice that helps you do that is going to benefit you because you are spirit at the core of who you are and you are holy. So if you want to be in touch with the Holy Spirit, then come back to self and this is where God is and you will greatly benefit from that. So I'm, I'm a fan of that. That's how I would, I would put that. Yeah. Yeah. But great text. Thank you, yes. Elena. Yes, yes yeah. for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Well, does that uh, lead us into our next segment, which is um, something I've been looking forward to for a long time? It's the Heretic of the Week. Hello. I'm Michael Petroni, showrunner of the Netflix show Messiah. And some people might think I'm a heretic. Hi, Michael. Hi, Michael. <laughs> Hi guys. <laughs> hey, Michael, uh, in, in spite of that very unenthusiastic uh, welcome, we are so, so excited to have you as uh, our Heretic of the Week on the Heretic Happy Hour podcast. Um, we are huge, huge fans of this amazing show that you have created. Um, and we want to talk you. about it. Yeah. So I guess, right. yeah, one thing I, I'm curious about, Michael, is um, and if you can talk a little bit, like what was the inspiration for this? You know, like what gave you the idea to create a show uh, with this kind of a setting that kind of pushes the buttons that it does and crosses the lines that it does? I mean, what what was it that kind of inspired you to say, "Wow, this would be this would be something that I think audiences would enjoy"? It was kind of like it's it was just one of those obvious ideas that kind of hit me between the eyes. You know, I, I think everyone's kind of had that, you know, that what if, you know, what if, uh, you know the messiah came back i mean or what if we some some people thought the messiah was here and and so you know i think that the idea started to sort of have traction with me when i actually started to take the idea seriously like what would this world with its complicated religious 
uh, issues and politics and boundaries and uh, with social media, how would a Messiah kind of fare today? Mm -hmm. And so to me, that then became what became the grist for the show. Yeah. Well, one thing I, I think is really great, and then maybe what I should do is maybe ask you, since we, you know, since we started off with some, sort of the, some people might call you a heretic. I'm curious, um, sort of because you have set this character up as not a purely Christian Messiah, he sort of belongs to no one and yet to everyone, right? So um, I'm imagining that it's that and many other things that you decided to do with the show is might have ruffled some feathers, not just uh, in the in the show, but also in the real world. So what are some of the reactions that you've gotten or why do you think people have reacted, um, have, have said some people have sort of um, maybe wanted to call you a heretic or, or think the show might be like, oh, I don't know about it. Well, I got to say, I think that when the trailer came out before the show actually launched, there was a lot of, there, I think there was a big reaction and, you know, not necessarily, it was a very noisy reaction. And yes, there was a, that seemed a lot of people seemed to be upset. But then when the show came out and people actually watched the show, I think all the people that thought they were going to be upset about it kind of became fans of the show. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> and I think that's like a testament to like our due diligence in the show because we really did go to, you know, great efforts to make sure that we weren't really, we, our intention was not to upset anyone, but to have include as many people from as many different walks of life and as many different belief systems, not even necessarily religious ones, mm -hmm. could could enjoy the show and watch it and get something out of it and, and for the show to actually bring up questions in them. And so it was a very fine line we had to walk in terms, like you said, like when when you aren't necessarily abiding by the absolute constraints of uh, what one particular religion assumes a messiah is going to be or look like, or uh, then yeah, you've got to walk. It's a it's a tightrope act, and so and we know like there are people who aren't going to necessarily agree with everything we've done, but that's okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And Michael, my, this is Jamal, by the way, and it's great to have you on the podcast. Thank you for for coming on and. Um, I, I have really also like Keith, I've been really enjoying the show as, as many people have. And I, you know, one of the things I picked up cause I, a little bit about my background, I come from a Muslim background and, um, and also a Christian background uh, here in the States. So, you know, one of my parents is Muslim and one of my parents is devout Catholic. And so I, um, I've appreciated one of the things I've appreciated watching the show is you kind of don't know, you know, in one aspect, there's a sense of like, well, is this Messiah figure, is he a Muslim? Um, or, or is he a Christian? Because you can kind of, but I, what I'm taking away from the, the show is that nobody can really claim this figure, um, that he doesn't really fit in any box, obviously, as you kind of were alluding to, which I really love. It's really refreshing. Um, but I wanted to ask you specifically, um, because I know in our podcast, one of the things we try to to address is this whole problem of sectarianism or tribalism that tends to uh, calls us to break down as a, as as a humanity, you know. Specifically, when we're talking about spirituality, these are things that would, you would think would bring us together, but so often wars and conflict are a result of sectarian or tribalism. And this Messiah figure seems to really seem to poke at that, or or try to break down those walls. Was that your aim as the creator of the show? Did did, did you go into the creating the show with that aim in mind? I don't think the show. Look, I don't. I think that's the that possibly the intention of the character uh, mm. that, you know, the sh people in the show calling al uh, You know, I, the show doesn't intend to do anything but just pose questions. It, mm. it, I know that's maybe a, a frustrating answer, <laughs> but we, we, it, we, we really don't, we, we didn't set out to proselytize or to really achieve any kind of like goal with the audience other than to have the question be put in the audience's lap and have it, and create an interesting discussion, which I think the show's creating. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. In terms of the tribalism and sectarianism that exists in religion, I think, I think you can't avoid it when, I think the difference between faith and religion is religion is a, a, a uh, uh, organization of ideas around the faith and faith is something personal and I think that's the friction that 
will always exist between faith and religion. And I, I think that, that's definitely, you know, a, a big sort of theme in the show. And uh, mm-hmm. so, yeah, he kind of knows as a character how to sort of create that friction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one thing, um, as you guys were talking, what I realized was something, I think one of the reasons I love this show so much, um, is that I think what the, what, what the Messiah does, what the show does um, in an, in, on an entertainment field um, is point out the fact, it kind of puts a, puts a finger on or shines a light on the fact that for so many Christians, I know for sure, but, and, but probably other fundamentalist religious people, um, it, it, they seem to have a craving for knowing, right? And, and which, but as we feel on this on this podcast, we feel like the the opposite of faith isn't doubt; it's certainty. Uh, and so and that's one thing I like about the character and about the show is that actually, it's it's I think it's drawing people to the unknowing. It's drawing people to the mystery. It's drawing people to the I don't know, but I'm but I'm intrigued by not knowing, and I'm actually. You know, maybe I'm enjoying some mystery. I'm enjoying the fact that I don't, <laughs> right? Well, that's great. I, I, yeah, I, 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 I you know, I, I think, again, the idea of tribalism and sectarianism sort of comes out of the idea of people knowing rather mm-hmm. than questioning. People yeah. knowing rather than living in the mystery. Yeah. And, yeah, I think, I think the character... Uh, he's mysterious, and his. Uh, if you, I mean, if you, uh, just if you look at the character narratively, he just seems to go where fate takes him, and yeah. uh, it seems that way. Or maybe he's got this master plan, <laughs> but how, wh- whatever it is, he 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 seems to be able to just live in the question mark of it all, rather yeah. than have like, but forcing an agenda. He never forces an agenda. Mm. Mm. I, yes, I really, really love that about the character, and that's, and I think that's what is is surprising for me as a, as a just somebody who's watching them. I'm surprised at that there does not seem to be an agenda from this character, which is so often not what you get from, you know, typical religious conversations. Um, I guess a question I would have for you. Um, as okay, because I know you know when you create something, you know you obviously your heart and soul is poured into the project from from conception to birth, and now that it's launched and it's out there and people are watching it, is has there been anything that has surprised you um, from either either you uh, just taking in the the season as as everyone else would, you know, from an observer standpoint, or from the reaction standpoint, has has there been something that's been that you didn't expect that has come out of the launch and uh, of this project for you? No, I can't say. I, I, I'm just, I'm so delighted with the reaction. I think it's incredibly, I think people have really engaged with it and it's created a whole lot of discussion. And really that, that was absolutely the, the, like the, that could, that's the best result we could, mm. we could think of. And so I, I'm not I'm not surprised, but I'm very pleased because we went in hoping that that would be the case. And I, I feel like it, it, the show's doing what we wanted it to do. Yeah. So uh, I may not, this may not be a, an allowable question, but is there a season two? I was going to ask that too. <laughs> <laughs> look, if everyone keeps watching, look, we're getting, look, it's, the numbers are good. I feel good about it, but, you know, uh, everyone's just going to have to, Keep being fans of the show, and hopefully we'll get a season two. So let me well, let me ask it this way, Michael: If they call, if Netflix called you tomorrow and said, "Michael, we're in season two. Could you sit down right now and you have a story in your head or a basic idea of where it would go next?" Absolutely. Oh, that's great. That's because if you don't, I yes. have some ideas for you. I'd love to sit down and give you ideas. <laughs> um, can I ask you this? I'd love to know where you think the show's going. That that, that would be that well, would be. I, yeah. Very intriguing. Well, I would love to tell you, but if I tell you on the podcast, it would sort of spoil some things for people, and I don't want to spoil anything. So maybe I'll just tell you privately some other time. Okay. Um, but but I did have okay. this question. I did have this question for you as I'm watching the character of the Messiah on the show, uh, Alma C. Um, and again, what I love that you do so well. In fact, I when I saw the trailer, I told my wife Wendy, I said, "This is the only way I'm going to watch this show and stick with it is if they can do this. If they if you guys can hold the tension all the way through between whether he is the Messiah or whether he's a charlatan 
And this whole thing is a put on. Because the minute you tell me 100%, oh, he is the Messiah, I'm out. And the minute you say 100%, no, it's all put on, I'm out. But if you can keep the mystery and keep the tension, I'm in. And you, you guys did a beautiful job. Um, but, but well, as thank I'm, you. Yeah, but as, as I'm watching it, what I'm noticing about the character, I'm a C, you know what? He reminds me of people, of someone like Darren Brown. You know who Darren Brown is? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know Darren Brown. <laughs> so for people that don't know, he's a magician and a mentalist and all this. And he actually even does, I think he has a Netflix show called uh, Miracle, where he basically... Yeah, he does. He, yeah. And I thought... He, a, he has a whole show where he literally pulls people up on stage and cures them. And it yeah. seems like they literally seem cured. And, you know, he, he, he just spouts that it's mind over matter. Yeah. And see, I thought... Somebody with skills like Darren Brown, but who looked like Almasy, could totally do exactly what this guy is doing. I mean, was it was that kind of thing in your head at all as you were writing this? Because I I think like man, it, it's actually almost frightening how easy I think in real life you probably could pull something like this off. I mean, well, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, we definitely, I definitely, I, 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 you know, there are figures like like Darren Brown, absolutely, you know, they're, they're the people that it's true. Like if, if he wanted to create a religion around himself, I think he could probably easily do it. Mm -hmm. Which is scary. Because I think people (laughs) want, because I think people, uh, you know, I I think they want to believe in things and they need, and, and there's nothing wrong with hope. And I think hope gets people through things. Yes. Uh, you know, he just takes a very cynical attitude towards all that. And, you know, I guess his agenda is to prove the cynical sort of point of point of, of it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that's only one point of view, which I think the show also sort of delves into. I mean, you have the character of Michelle Monaghan's character, Eva. Yeah. I mean, you know, she, she's, she's a non-believer, but to be a non-believer, that's a kind of its own belief, belief system. Yeah. Exactly. So everyone has a belief system, even when they don't think they do. Exactly. Even Darren. Even Darren. No, you're right. No, I totally agree. Yes. Yeah. Well, the, the the Messiah figure, it seems to, what I think is really can be even therapeutic for people who watch it is, you know, because we're all we're all relating to the characters we're seeing on the on the screen. And what I love about the Messiah figure is he helps people become conscious of what they're running from, what they're dealing with, um, that maybe they're not willing to look at themselves. And that's what I see just from a, from a standpoint of like, you know, becoming conscious and self-aware. Um, that's what I see happening in the show. So I, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, he says at some point I, I I'm holding up a mirror and I yeah. think yeah. that, no, and, and that you could take that religiously, you could take that politically, you can take that in many, many different ways. Yeah. But, um, you know. And that's profound. And I think that's any show, any, uh, which I love, I think there's a number of shows that have been out, you know, in the last few years that have been like that. They've been so impactful to our, to our culture, especially here in America, because they are like holding up a mirror to the consciousness of people. And I really think your show does that really well. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Michael, I tell you what, you are making the kind of, with this show, certainly, you make the kind of shows I love so much. And I hope that this does get a second season. And I hope you get uh, an opportunity to keep making shows like this because, um, you know, because it, it does ask amazing questions. And I love that it doesn't try to give us answers. You know, I think actually that's the problem is that um, people are too quick to give answers. But I think there's so much more power uh, in a well-asked question, you know, it can really take us much more interesting places. And you've done that with the show. Uh, and it's obviously spawned a whole lot of great dialogue. So thank you. Uh, well, thanks. I mean, yeah, th- I think that's uh, really the intention is, you know, we, we never, we, I'm not even interested in proselytizing a- any agenda. So and I think if you do that, you kind of lost. You've you've lost your interest in your audience because then you're force feeding them something. So yeah, uh, yeah, we don't want to close people's eyes to things. It's it's um you know we want to open up a conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's the best kind of thing to do. And I, I appreciate you doing that um, in this format. And and I thank you so much, Michael, for being our guest on the Heritage Cap here. I appreciate your time. Um, and again, I'm excited to see what what's going to happen next. Thanks, guys. It's an absolute pleasure. All right. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Oh, my goodness. Michael Petroni, wow. Uh, That was a score. I'm personally really, really, really happy that we uh, were able to talk to Michael. 
here on the podcast, especially to talk about his amazing show, which you haven't seen it, everybody. Seriously. I mean, don't don't stop right now. Finish listening to the podcast. But as soon as you finish listening to this podcast, then jump over to Netflix and watch The Messiah. It's seriously, seriously so well done. Not cheesy, not any typical Christian thing. Um, extremely thought provoking. Not even and Christian per se. No, and that's what I love about it is that it's it is. I mean, it is and it isn't. It's definitely, uh, but it's definitely speaking to and po- shining a light on the way that Christians sort of um, the way they might respond to, to a figure like this who showed up, and uh, both good and bad ways that we would might respond to that. Uh, as well as not only Christian but Muslim uh, politically as well as religious um, responses to this figure, it's really fascinating. I've really, really, um, really gotten so much out of watching. In fact, I want to go back and watch it again. Yeah, yeah, I I totally agree, Keith. <clears throat> He's um, this guy created something special, no question. I've you know I I love to watch shows, and but I I haven't seen a show in a long time that really you know, made me feel that way. I mean, it's, it's, you can really see the inspiration in it and it's beautiful. And again, it's not Christian, but I do believe it will cause you to really think about the nature of life. And also, um, I really believe, understand the purpose of, of Jesus. <laughs> That's my understanding, mm-hmm. really the purpose of Jesus, um, in a better way, because it doesn't have the trappings of, uh, Christianity on it. Cause Christianity, honestly, right. I do believe has, has totally hidden Jesus from 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 our sight. So the trappings of that religion. So uh, it, this is refreshing, really good. And I, I sometimes I'll talk to people about the Messiah series, and they're like, "Yeah, I haven't heard of it." I'm like, "How? This is a tragedy. You need to go to Netflix again. <laughs> go to Netflix. It's on Netflix, which is extremely accessible to humans. And wa- watch yes. this thing <laughs> because, man, it is good. It is that good. Yeah. Oh yeah, it and really and, and not only that, but it 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 um. The interview fits perfectly with the beginning of our series today, which is just as important, right? So we're doing metaphysics, and mm-hmm. we're going to talk about miracles. And mm-hmm. I have been excited about this series. I don't know what I think about miracles, so I'm going to kick it. I'm going to kick the can <laughs> down the road and ask you guys what you guys think because I I struggle with this one. This is one yeah. I struggle with. So I want to hear from you guys first. Well, it's a great, I think it really is a good topic. I'm curious too, to hear what uh, what both you guys have to say about it. So, and I'm, because I think I'm pretty sure we're going to come at it from different directions, um, just kind of knowing each other the way we have over the years. I mean, as I was thinking about the topic today, I was just, I mean, in general, I would say, I do believe in miracles. I believe I've experienced some pretty specific miracles in my life. Um, and I'm happy to share some stories about those maybe down the road here if you want to hear some stories. But um, but but things that to me are no doubt, I mean, I, I don't know what else to call it except miracles, whether that was a healing or whether that was uh, something just serendipity where, um, you know, things just aligned perfectly and and, and the timing was just unbelievable. Uh, where it's like I, I step back and I have to say, wow, that I would have to say that was a miracle that just happened. Um so I, I I believe in miracles. I'm open to miracles. I do think miracles do happen. Now, the difference, I think, when we get into a topic like miracles, and I'm hoping we're going to tackle this as well, is, so the one hand is, do you believe in miracles? Are they real or are they not? But even if, so once you say, yes, you think they're real, then the next thing is, well, then how, why is it they happen sometimes to some people and that they don't happen other times to other people? Uh, is there some sort of a formula? Is there some sort of a, what's going on with that? Um, and I think it's also worth discussing miracles, uh, at least as they're perceived or as they're believed outside of Christianity, because I mean, pretty much anything you as a Christian could say you experienced as a miracle, you could find someone who's a Hindu or a Muslim or someone who's Jewish or almost any other religion who could say, you know, I was praying to my God or I was, you know, asking for this thing. And then this result happened. And, uh, and I'm, you know, it's the truth. Uh, I remember watching a, what was, I remember watching this Bollywood film. I can't remember the name of it, but it was about this guy who was, a, worships this Hindu monkey God. And he just loves this monkey God, whoever he worships, get the name of the God anyway, but he, he worships him. And he's so devoted to this God, to this Hindu God. Um, he, he refuses to tell a lie. 
So he has incredible integrity, even when it's something that gets him in trouble because he refuses to tell a lie. He has to tell the truth. And he's praying to his God and and then miracles happen and things work out, which of course he attributes to his God. And and watching this from a completely, you know, outside of perspective, I just realized, oh my gosh, see, this is something universal. This is a human experience that people have in their religion. And then what we tend to do, we all do this. We then say, well, because I prayed to that God and this this uh, was answered in some way, and I, I believe this God worked a miracle for me, that's validation of my religion. That's validation of this God uh, that proves everything is true about my religion. And uh, it made me sit back and say, well, maybe that isn't true. Like maybe I, we shouldn't take all of that together and say, well, because this, you know, I prayed and this happened, therefore it validates everything about my entire religious experience or my, all of my theology or whatever. Um, and then that's another, I think, sort of a, a facet to this discussion of miracles. So what do you guys think? Matt, what? Jamal, <laughs> oh, you want me to go? Well, I, I will say, uh, Keith, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be interested in listening to those stories. I think that'd be a good time, like when we get into our bonus round for our for our Patreon listeners. There you go. We'll, we'll hit those stories because I'll be curious to to listen to them. Um, and I think our listeners would would be curious to hear those stories, but they're gonna have to sign up for Patreon. You feel me? Um, but I just I I, I, I have not really witnessed anything that I could say is what most people typically call a miracle. I, what I will say though is that I think the human being has um, perhaps way more potential than than we really think. And what I mean by that is mm-hmm. that if there are any sort of healings that can't be explained by uh, science or, or the medical field, or, or we typically think of healings or, I mean, you know, maybe the walking on water, turning water to wine, all that kind of stuff. I don't think it's God or a God necessarily like a deus ex machina swooping in to save the day like a superhero. I I, I think it has nothing to do with that. I think it has to do with perhaps who we could be as human beings if we were more in tune with our true humanness. And I don't know what that necessarily means um, because I'm not going around healing people. So or myself, otherwise I would just heal heal my flu. And I would be on with it. Um, but so, so, so that's where I'm at. So if there are anything that, if there's some sort of miraculous, you know, some guy doesn't have legs and all of a sudden we do a prayer and his legs grow and he stands up and walks. I've never seen that. I've never heard of anything like that. But if it did, ha- if it did happen, right. I don't think it's some sort of God out there doing anything. I think it would be. Um, well, can I ask you, can I ask you why you, why would you, why would you say that it can't be a God. I'm not saying it can't be. I'm just saying, I'm just saying for me that, that, that God who does that is really shitty at his job because a bunch of kids are dying right now of leukemia and starvation and stuff like that. So it could happen. It's logically possible. I'm not saying it's a logical impossibility. He just sucks at his job big time. And that, that's just how I feel. Like, (laughs) like I would fire that guy in a second because any doctor, any doctor who had that (laughs) potential to do that, and, and any decent human being, and, and human beings can be pretty shitty sometimes, they would do that. I would, I mean, you know what I mean? Like, okay, so you, you know, right. it always just, it always just for me, uh, I see like people being able to hear a little bit better or their, or their lower back feels better now, or their leg grew a half an inch. And I'm like, yo, there's, there's, there's some, you can go down to the burn unit, you know what I mean? You could go down to the, uh, the children's ICU right. or the neurotrauma. Like, come on. Like if God, if God could do it and God doesn't, um, this is where I like Thomas J. Ord stuff of God can't, like, I don't think God can do these things, um, because yeah. if God can and he doesn't, then you, I, for me, it creates a theodicy nightmare and I just really can't go there. Mm-hmm. Wow. Right, but that's, I mean, you want me to tell you how I really feel? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, man. Um, I'm so glad that you're sick and don't have any energy because wow, what will we do? I feel that flush. <laughs> oh, that took it all out of me. <laughs> I, uh, you're spent. I'll see you guys later. Have a good show. Well, Matt, <laughs> I actually, man, I love that. I love a lot what you're saying there. You know, um, I, I'm with you. I, so I've, ex- I've seen, I've met people. I've met a guy who was raised from the dead. who was dead like three days. And it was at his funeral. Was it Jesus? No, no he was. 
No, I met that guy though. I do know him. I've met Jesus. Okay. Well, no, I'm no, being Jesus. serious. I met a guy. I met uh, a guy in India who was dead three days and it was a Hindu village and uh, his wife prayed for him and uh, the whole village was gathered because he was an elder in the village. The whole uh, village was gathered as customary in this, in this particular village to mourn with the family. And his wife prayed over his body and he woke up. He was alive. Um, I tend to believe mm. it. And plus I met the, mm. I met, I was in that village. I met a lot of the folks in that village. They all testified to that story. It's crazy, crazy. But nevertheless, I've experienced personal miracles in my own life and I've seen it. I've known other people to experience those as well. Um, but I don't believe in miracles. So, um, you're going to, yeah, really you're going to have to unpack that. Hold on. <laughs> well, wait, so we're, we are really all three on completely different pages. So I have experienced miracles and I believe them. Uh, Matt has not experienced miracles and doesn't really believe them. And Jamal has experienced miracles and doesn't believe them. Wow. Okay. <laughs> what do you, what do you mean? What do you mean by that? Jamal? <laughs> okay. Well, well here. Okay. I would have said in the past that God did, you know, the miraculous. And what we mean by miraculous is we mean something that's super or ex, oh, extra, extraordinary in that sense, you know? So, but I do, yeah, no, where I'm at today is I don't believe that miracles exist. And I don't believe that Jesus even did any miracles either. Cause I read the gospels and the more I read the gospels, I'm going, yeah, Jesus didn't do. I mean, Honestly, I don't think he did any miracles, but I think there may be a case where people could say he did one or so, but I, really that's a stretch. So the reason I say that, and, and this has to, this is, has to do with perception. So, and I, Matt, I think you're onto something here. Um, I honest, my personal, I don't believe there's a God out there. That's just my understanding. There's no God out there who does miracles because there's no God out there. Forget the miracle thing. Part. There's just no God out there because we've been to space. We've been to the moon. We've sent, you know, ships into the, I mean, we just, God's not hanging out in space. So there's no God out there. Now I understand people, maybe a different dimension, but there's no God out there. The full revelation that we are in waking up to is the fact that God is in somewhere. He's not out anywhere. So God is in and through the physical order. And basically the physical order, from my understanding, comes from the unseen. Even Paul says this, everything visible comes from the invisible, that invisible, I would call the divine. So everything is a manifestation of this divine. So any miraculous event we see is what we're seeing is something that doesn't seem typical. Now I agree with that. There were some things that Jesus did. There's some things I've seen. There's something that what people will call miracles, but I actually think that is simply a break from conditioning. So for example, now I could uh, just quick story about that. Quick story about this. And I want to go back to the scripture. Okay. Cause I, some people may think I'm crazy, but it doesn't exist. Just so you know, well, the Bible doesn't exist, but there are, oh, I hear, no, you're right. okay, sorry. there are writings that they put in the Bible that are clearly they, exist. <laughs> those are real. No, I've seen those. You're right. I've read a couple of those, but the Bible was put together in the fourth century. So the, the compilation as we have it is a invention of a political ruler. So aside from that, yes, Yes. Aside from that, the, there is a story in which Jesus, uh, you know, healed the sick and did all these things, sent the disciples out two by two. They go out and then, um, so the disciples, like he sends them out to do that, which is like extraordinary. So the disciples were like, oh my gosh, they were used to seeing limitation. Sick, pre sick people typically aren't healed by laying hands on them. Sick, you know, these different things, um, they were doing that. That's typically not done, but he saw, they saw Jesus do it. So they were like, Oh, we, we may, and he sent them out and said, you'll be able to do this. And they did it. Um, which is extraordinary. So then they come and they, they, they run into this boy who had, um, who was had like some, you know, they thought he was, I think the writers were like, Oh, they, he was demon possessed. Now what was actually going on? We don't know. I mean, he could be an epileptic. It could be what, you know, he kept throwing himself into the fire and injuring himself. It was really a bad situation. So this father was desperate to get healing for his son. They take him to the disciples. The disciples were unable to heal this boy. So they, the father comes to Jesus and says, your disciples weren't able to do this. And then Jesus gets really upset, which is interesting. It's like ticked. And he's like, bring that boy to me. You know, how you, you know, worthless generation. How much longer do I have to put up with you guys? Bring the boy to me, which is an interesting response. And then he heals the boy. And then the disciples are like, 
kind of like come to Jesus with their tail between their legs, kind of like, hey, like, why couldn't we do this? And his response is one of the best responses I've ever read, ever. I love it. And I think it sheds light on this entire thing. Um, and Jesus said, he goes, I'll tell you why you can't do it. <laughs> and he said, if you had just a little faith, which is so interesting, you could say to this mountain, be moved and it shall be moved. Now, <laughs> I understand how that passage has been abused by the health, wealth, prosperity folks. Oh, because they, they use that and say, well, you see, you don't have a little faith. No, no, no. It's an absolutely absurd thing. It's absurd to say if you only, because he's basically saying if you had faith as small as a mustard seed in other places, which is basically like in our day, we would say if you had faith like a, an atom or even, even a smaller than atom, like an electron or like a quark in the quantum world, if you had faith like that, which is basically saying it doesn't take any faith, just a little bit, just a tiny bit, you literally can move the biggest thing in your path, which is, is an absurd, small to big, small to big. So the idea, there's this thing in a course in miracles, which I don't know how you feel about the course in miracles, but there's a lot of sayings in there. I I love that. One of the sayings is there is no order of difficulty in miracles. (laughs) So whether it's a mountain, (laughs) it doesn't matter. So we look at miracles and we go, oh, well, that's a bigger miracle than this one over here. I found a dollar. I found a million dollars. But when it comes to divine source energy, everything is possible. Like you can do anything and it's effortless. The only reason the disciples couldn't do it is because they were not operating from their source energy, faith. And this is why it was impossible. And Jesus was saying, look, we've been over this. Like, So what were the disciples doing? Here's what they were doing. They were operating on conditioning. Because if you just live the world, live in the world like you see it, you go, well, that's possible. That's not possible. This is possible. This is not. Most of us have never seen miracles. So therefore, we don't believe in them. The the disciples saw some miracles, therefore believed in some of them because they saw it, but that's conditioning because what happens when you run upon, run across a situation you have no power over, then if the conditioning hasn't given you the picture of it, you can't do it. You're powerless. But when you operate from the self, you can do anything. It's perfectly normal to do miracles if you're not operating from conditioning. That's my view. That's my take. It's not miraculous. It's just human. It's natural. It's kind of what Matt was saying. It's like, you can do anything when you're tapped into your true humanness, your true potential. This is what Jesus was doing. And and, and when Jesus healed somebody, he'd say, it was your faith that made you whole. He'd point it back. It's from you. I just brought it out of you. So how do we, how do we not let that be abused though? Because the first thing I think of is that, well, there's that tragic story of this two-year-old that died up in Bethel Redding. And they were praying for resurrection and praying and praying and praying and nothing happened. And to me, then you could be, you could, you could start scapegoating. You could start getting, oh, well, you didn't have enough faith or they didn't have enough faith. So if you only had faith, then she would have been raised from the dead. Well, it's never and, a question of, it's never a question of faith. See, I think that's how it's been abused. Well, if you had, if you had enough faith, we all have enough faith. Everybody has faith. Everybody. I think what Jesus is saying is if you operate from it, you can do anything. That's a provocative statement. Right. He did make that statement. But the, the, I think the challenge, though, is that, like, for example, and I don't want this whole thing to be about the Bethel thing, but the people of Bethel would say, that's all they're doing is operating in faith. Like, what do you mean we're not operating in faith? That's that's exactly what we're doing. We're, we're operating in faith 24-7. And they would even say they're seeing people getting healed in their services, you know, on a weekly basis. Um, so it, they would say well, they are seeing healing. People are experiencing healing. In this one particular case, um, it didn't happen. This this baby wasn't did not come back to life. Hmm. Um, I mean, so so my my thing on that is, and I do want to hear what you think, Jamal. But but my thing is, um, like I I do believe in miracles, but I don't think I don't I don't believe in formulas. Like I don't think that that's how it works. Like even the, the couple of times I have experienced miracles uh, in my life or seen miracles in my family and things like that. Um, it's never been the same way twice. Like it's not a formula. It's not like, uh, you have to pray the right way or, you know, beg or plead or any of those things. Cause sometimes, I mean, some of the times when I've experienced miracles, the prayers have been pretty weak. (laughs) It's been almost like, God, I know you're not going to do it, but you know, just in case I'm just going to toss it out there. Amen. And then, whoa, what happened? And then other times, I mean, I've, I prayed for people. Uh, that I, you know, I'd pray my guts out and pray and pray and pray for hours and fast and all kinds of stuff. And, and my friend died of cancer, 
and you just, you know what I mean? So, uh, I guess I, I do believe in miracles. I do think I've seen them. I do believe they happen. I'm not sure I could tell you how they happen or why they happen. I don't think there's a formula that we could make it happen all the time, every time. Um, and yeah, I even, if- I even not sure how I, Oh, I was just going to say one last thing. Uh, I, I, I even, I'm not sure how I feel even about the idea. Like I hear what you're saying about Jesus affirming the disciples, you know, he sent them out to heal and they did and cast out demons and they did or whatever was going on there. Um, and I see that you're right. But then at the same time, I see like um, other places, for example, where Paul, you know, asked the question to the church in Corinth, like, uh, you know, are all apostles, are all prophets, do all work miracles, do all speak in tongues? And the implied answer is no, meaning not everyone does all of these things. So some do and some don't. And that's even then now we're getting into more of like uh, some people have as maybe a certain gifting for those kinds of things and others, you know, may not. Anyway, just some thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, well, first I think, I think the key Again, I love what you said. It's not a formula. The reason it's not a formula is because that would be conditioning. We've seen this done. This is how we do it. But I'm not talking about repeating like, oh, I saw this done. Now let me do that. There's the principle at hand that Jesus is getting to. The reason the disciples, going back to that story, it's a powerful story. The reason they couldn't help that boy is because they were operating on conditioning because they had never seen that before. And to them, they were like, whoa, this is a big one. I don't think we can, we're not cut out for this one. This is, this is a big one. But again, the principle is, look, if you operate from divine energy, that is not a big one. It's not like, oh, this is too big. So, and again, what does divine energy call for in the moment? I don't know. There's no formula. So should, should, you know, it's again, it it looks different from each situation, but I'll tell you what's interesting. This is interesting about prayer. People talk about praying for a miracle. Most prayer is totally ineffective for one reason, because it's done in anxiety. Prayer in anxiety is worthless. This is why Paul says, you know, do not be anxious for anything, but in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. That is profound. I'll give Paul kudos for that. It's a profound statement. So wait a minute. And then you might say, well, why would you pray? Most people are going, I need a miracle. God, help me. God, help me. God didn't help me. Dang it. Well, because it's, ang- it's all anxiousness. This is not how you pray. So it's interesting that, and then the question is like, well, if I don't, if I, why would I pray then <laughs> if I wasn't anxious? <laughs> why would I pray? Well, the, here's the thing. In order to actually not be anxious you, and to have be gratitude, gratitude is a high frequency state of being. You cannot be grateful for something and, and see a lack. It's impossible. You cannot hold two thoughts at the same time. You can either be grateful or you can feel impoverished and lack. So it's interesting that if you have a need that you get to a state where you are thankful, which I believe involves imagination, and then that becomes the prayer. There's an imagination of something that you want to see happen. That that is a prayer. And then that becomes the effective prayer that happens. And I experienced this the other day, just bonafide thing. I had a friend. His dog ran away. It's totally ran away. Ran away in part of the part up up in the mountains here. That like it's kind of you know dogs run away up here. You don't usually find them because there's a lot, especially if they're not from around here. And uh, we were pretty concerned about that. There was some anxiety. My wife, my wife was really feeling anxious about that. So uh, that was at, at night. The next morning, dog was still gone, pretty early, and uh, we were driving and just so anxious. And I instantly thought, well, like in my Christian days, I'd be like, well, let's pray about this. Let's just ask God out of anxiousness. Let's just ask God for a miracle. And I was like, you know what? I've learned not to do that because it doesn't work. So I'm like, let, what? so I just thought that I was like, well, what, what is it? What's the best case scenario? What do we want to see happen? So I just kind of took some time to breathe and like tune into ourself. And immediately I had this image, this picture came to mind and it was a picture of the dog walking back up to the house. So I said, Hey. Mm-hmm. Let's just picture that. Let's just center in that picture. Let's think about that. So my wife and I, as we're driving, we just thought about that picture and centered on it and just thought about it. And we actually felt like, let's feel what that would be like if it was true. Let's actually feel the essence of that. Not like hope, like I want this to happen. Please make it happen. Please. Not like that. Just like, hey, I'm just imagining, just using imagination. No, not attachment, not, not going to make it happen. Not going to see if this will work. Nothing like that. Just, let's just, just imagine because we were in a state where we were worried and that's not a good state to be in. So we're like, let's just imagine what we want to see happen. And I kid you not, that's exactly mm-hmm. what happened. 
So, you know, I wanted to, I'm glad you said that because I, I was going to just say something along similar lines. Like over the last couple of years, I have shifted the way I pray. Um, I, I totally agree with you. Like uh, so much of the time, man, I feel like, you know, since I was nine years old, I have been conditioned to pray in such a way that I'm basically begging God to be good. Um, and so a, a couple of years ago, I just stopped doing that. Um, well, I'm still, let me say, I'm actually still learning. So what I initially, I'll be honest, a lot of times my knee jerk reaction, my reflexive reaction, when there's a problem or an issue or something, uh, like for example, Wendy's mom just had a stroke uh, yesterday. And so we were like, oh my gosh, you know, let's pray. And so you, you, you did my reflexive action is say, oh God, please do X, Y, and Z. Right. But then if I stop and I go, well, wait a minute, what am I doing? I'm actually asking, I'm begging God to be who God already is. Like, who, in other words, to be who I believe God already is to say. And so instead I'll shift it and say, actually, God, I just want to thank you that you are a loving father. I believe you're a good God. I believe you love your children. I believe it's your desire to touch people and, and heal people and bless people and comfort people that are afraid and draw near to people that are going through stress, that you're near to the brokenhearted. Like I just, I basically then shift my prayer from begging God to be who he is to, to, to declaring who God already is. Uh, and just resting in the, the assurance of that, what I believe is, you know, just basically saying who God is, who is who Jesus reveals the Father to be, right? The, this loving Abba Father. And so, number one, it is uh, it's helped me to not be always in this mode of begging God to do something or begging God to be something that he already is. Like, I, why am I doing that? Um, but it's also then taken away a lot of that fear and that anxiety uh, at the, like immediately. So, cause what it does is it, it, it centers me and, and I, I start resting in the knowledge and the assurance that I, that God is good. And then I'm not in this place of, uh, fear or anxiety. Yeah. I like that. Uh, Karis, Mark Karis gives that example in his book, uh, divine echoes about the way we pray is, um, it would be like asking a world renowned surgeon, um, you know, mm -hmm. reminding her before she does surgery on, on, <laughs> our loved ones and, you know, make sure you do the best work, make sure you, you know, do, 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 do this good job. So I, I get all that. I, I think I, I, I still just struggle with, uh, I certainly can, can see Jamal, like how that story, even about the dog, that's cool. Like, I, I love that. I think it's awesome. Um, the story about someone coming back to life after three days, that's awesome. Keith, the stories that you're going to tell, you know, after we wrap up this regular episode, that's all great. But it seems like people still do those things that y'all are saying and it doesn't happen. And that's where I, I don't know if it's like the cynic in me or, or what. And I'm just, I, I want to ask, you know, like, well, what's up with that? Like I could have all this positive mm -hmm. intention. I can, I could do things not out of anxiousness or not out of um, anything like that or stress. I could picture what it would feel like to have this happen and to have this reuniting with a runaway dog or, or something even more profound, maybe like, um, you know, a loved one who's really ill and they just sit up out of bed and they're fine. They're great. They're healthy. But it does, it, it, it's not always going to happen. And that's where I struggle. Right. It's like, well, and I know, and I know, I know it's not a formula. I understand all that. I just, I, I guess I just wrestle internally with the implications of that. Right. Well, I, no, that makes total I sense. think the question of what if it doesn't happen blocks and my, my understanding of it is it blocks the potentiality of what we might imagine because that's where we get hung up on. It's like, well, what if this doesn't happen? Because that's, and I understand that because that's conditioning because we've had a lot of conditioning where things seem very, we seem very limited in things. Now, again, I'm not saying everybody, if somebody has a dog run away, you can just imagine the dog coming back and that's what will happen. No, because sometimes if you take it, like, I don't know that that's always what would happen. But if I tap in to the, what I would call source essence, God essence, mm. that what will come to mind is exactly the divine will. Right. What's going What's to happen? Go like yeah. it's, but it's, it's, I'm tapping into it and then it becomes my desire. It, it feels my desire. It comes into my desire and I imagine it. So when, when people talk about what kind of a world could this be, when you start to imagine what kind of world this could be. This is like, it's it, to me, it's the essence of what Jesus says, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Well, where is heaven? 
So at, we're talking about a we're talking about source realm. I, I believe that to be consciousness, where there is the field of infinite possibility. Again, there's no limitation at that level. It's all possible at that level. It literally, the whole universe comes from that level of consciousness where everything is possible. So God, the divine is not operating from a place of limitation. So when we are operating by that energy, we begin to imagine what could be. And from that imagination, that becomes prayer, which then becomes a creative act in the world. Yeah. So we call those miracles, but I don't actually think they're miracles as much as it's just the way things are. You know, it, you know, in the body by, by in nature, like when the body is sick, it knows how to heal itself. The only reason the body doesn't heal is when something gets in the way of the healing process, but healing is the norm in every situation. It just, you know, it's just, there are things that get in the way of that. And the key is to like begin to find out what those things are, but it depends on what premise. Now, some people believe that, you know, that, that, that healing is not the norm. And so like sickness is the norm and that's, that's also a perception. And when that perception is there, that perception gets carried out. So it just all depends on what your starting point is. Yeah, you know, I, it's funny what you were describing. And I think actually, Jamal, you and I talked about this once before. And I don't know if it was on the podcast or just in private. But <clears throat> I've also experienced similar to what you're saying about the dog thing. Like I can remember a couple of times where I've gotten gotten up in the morning to pray. And... um and it's just a different, maybe a different, slightly different experience, or maybe a slightly different way of describing what you're just what you're talking about. For me, it wasn't so much that I was um, that I imagined the thing happening. Like it, it didn't feel like it was coming from my imagination. It felt more like sitting there thinking about the the problem or thinking about something that was on my mind, and and it, and I just sort of actually, but in a way, I did sort of see something. So maybe that that's what you mean. I sort of saw. I saw the thing and I saw the thing happening and it just felt mm -hmm. good. It felt like, yes, yep. there was sort of a yes in my spirit of like, yep, well, that's, that's big. Yeah. That's and, a yes. Yeah. That yes. Is yeah. Huge. And then it was, it was just basically more like me acknowledging that, yep, that, that would be a good thing if that happened. And it was almost sort of like, it's a done thing. It's going to happen. And then yep. a couple hours yeah, later, you let it go. and a couple hours later it happened. And it, and, yep. and it didn't even surprise me when it happened. It was like, well, yeah, that's kind of what I knew was, I almost knew it was going to happen. Um, totally. And so, yeah, that was a really, and again, it and doesn't an happen exciting, all the time, but it is a cool thing when it does happen. Well, see, I think when you tap into that, there's an excitement. There's like a, yes, there it is. That's the right answer. And you visualize it, you let it go and you don't even have to do it. No, I didn't it's do just anything. Like, yeah. You just, you, but you know what? It passed through you mm -hmm. in the sense that there was a visualization to me. That is prayer. That's effective prayer. Mm -hmm. But again, it's not anxious yep. and it's not like it's just tapping in. Now, if you really want to, well, if I can, if I can learn not to be anxious, that'd be amazing. So I would say that. <laughs> now, yeah, I mean, as you were talking to Jamal, and I'm, I'm pretty sure this is what you have in mind as you're describing some of these things. Like, and I think we've talked about this too on the podcast. Like, when you start studying, like I've watched some great YouTube videos and even some like uh, Joe Rogan things where he's had, he's had these quantum physicists on, and they've talked about you know quantum science and. Uh, quantum, quantum physics and the idea that basically all realities exist at once and time is an illusion and all things are happening sort of in, an, in the now. Um, mm -hmm. All possible realities are reality. Um, and there's multiple, re you know, multiple sort of uh, dimensions and phases of reality. Some of them could be overlapped on top of each other, all these kind of things, which is fascinating on the, on the scientific level, like how these quantum particles uh, are sometimes light years apart, but they're the same particle. So they're not divided by space. It's just crazy. But anyway, when you, when you start saying, okay, if this is the universe we live in, if we live in a universe that is sort of unbounded this way, that is, then in other words, there's more potential for these kinds of things that to a very primitive mind, we would say that's a flipping miracle. What else could that be? Right? How could this, how could these two particles be the same particle, even though they're apart from each other, right? How do, how do these photons know if I'm lo looking, then they go this way. But if, I, if I'm not looking, they go the other way and like all those kind of crazy things. So there are things even on the scientific level that seem unexplained, but that at the same time suggest that the way humans interact with reality, the way humans observe reality impacts reality, changes reality. Um, even on that level, it's sort of like, well, now, now what's going on when quote unquote, we are praying and it seems as right. if that prayer or that awareness or whatever you want to call it changes the reality in, a, in an unexpected way. That's a miracle. 
Totally. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, the whole thing is, is not what it seems like. For example, fo- light is made up of photons. Photons are invisible. There is no substance to photons. Mm. And, 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 and scientists have no idea how we can even see light, but you can see it by the, if we didn't, we couldn't see light, we couldn't see anything. So it's a, it's a miracle that we even see, <laughs> but it's not in the sense that, so what's happening at the level of consciousness, your consciousness perceives photons, which are completely invisible and gives it substance so that what you're looking at has form. It's an illusion. It's actually not like that. So everything you see, so what we call limitations are illusions. It, not, nothing it is as it seems. It's truly a matrix in, in that way. So we are, again, when we wake up to conscious source, we realize, oh, so when Jesus says, yeah, you can say to the mountain, be moved and it shall be moved. He meant something by that. That's not just, you don't just have to skip over that. Mm-hmm. Like there's a principle there. Like it's, it's real. So you're tapping into like the, oh, so this thing is moldable and shapeable. It's not fixed. We have this illusion. We're born into the world. The world exists independently. The universe exists independently. We, these little people get born into it and we interact with it. No wonder we feel limited and helpless, but that's an illusion because there's no world to be born into. The world is a perception of consciousness. So therefore (laughs) it's all moldable and changeable. And that's what Jesus is getting at. It's like it's like Yoda convincing Luke to pick up his X wing. Right? But 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 there's a lot of truth in that. I don't believe it. Yeah. Why you fail? That's right. Yeah, all right. All right. You it's know what else is a miracle? Hmm. It's a mir- It's a miracle that we have a website. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, yeah, sure. Yes. <laughs> well, just think about it. If Al Gore didn't invent the internet, we wouldn't have a website. And the internet is a, is is a miracle. Thank you, Al Gore. Yes. So yes, go to heretichappyhour.com. Make sure you bookmark that so you uh, can keep up to date with all of our cool shit. We have a store there. It's heretichappyhour.com slash store. We got t-shirts, we got hats, we got pillows, and the pillows are hilarious. They are beautiful. And uh, we also got a, fa- we got a Facebook group. So if you're on Facebook, look up Heresy After Hours, look up the Heretic Happy Hour podcast, and that one is exclusive for Patreon supporters. So make sure you sign up for that. And uh, yeah, if you do, you're going to get some of Keith's uh, miraculous stories oh, coming up soon. Here. No, that and so much more. So yes, we have a Patreon page. Um, and as a thank you to those of you who have supported the podcast financially, um, one of the things we love to do is to give you guys bonus content. So we, you know, when when we shut down everything, we turn the lights out and, you know, the janitor finishes sweeping everything out and, you know, we, we, we're just kind of sitting back and kick back and we just tell a few extra stories. We stay a little bit late. For you guys, tell a few extra stories, record some extra stuff just for the Patreon supporters on the Patreon page. And um, so you get bonus content, bonus interviews, um, and we have all kinds of extra cool stuff on the way down the road we can't wait to tell you about. But please join uh, the Patreon page. It's patreon.com slash hour, And you'll also get inside our exclusive Facebook group. For sure. For sure. And also sometimes from time to time, you know, listeners, if you've been listening to the show and uh, you feel like it could be beneficial for you, you'd like to have a you know more in-depth conversation with, uh, with the, the three hosts of the, of the show, you're, you are more than, uh, we, we actually have um, opportunities for you to schedule like private sessions where we have, com- you know, you have a conversation with the three hosts and you can ask, you know, um, questions and have dialogue there. And uh, so if you're interested in that, uh, just reach out to us and let us know you're interested in that. We'll give you the details on those private sessions. And also, I believe we have, are on iTunes. Is that right? Mm. We're, we're on iTunes now. We are. Yeah, yeah, that happened recently. Oh, just yeah. the other day. Yeah, just the other day. But hey, if you're listening to this and you have not rated or reviewed, reviewed us, can I ask a favor of you? Um, this isn't a prayer. It's just, just a request. <laughs> yeah. Could you rate us and review us? Like just take a moment. You can do it right from your iPhone. You can do it, you know, on the app there, the the, the iTunes app or whatever, um, and just rate us and review us, and that goes a long way to getting the show um, some visibility. Mm. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Actually, I think you can book the private session straight from the heritagecapier dot com store. Oh yes, just, it's on there. Yeah, yep. Just click that button. Click that button. And don't forget, um, go watch. Messiah on Netflix. Yeah, binge watch it. Do it. it. <laughs>